Good evening, everyone. Hi. Um, is this Dr. Kalpana? Yes. Oh, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Just give me um, two minutes, I'll be right back. Sure. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> How are you today? <laughs> Oh, I was mute. I just got back from a walk, Fort Green Park. Mm -hmm. I live by Fort Green Park. I did the stairs. Okay. Um, very intense. Good, so good job. Right. You did great. I just started. This is my second day. Yeah, but you know what? The weather is good, so you can just continue. Yes, yeah, this I'm is a good time. The good I, time. I'm gonna do it every day. That's it. Awesome. Hi, Eden. Hi, Dr. Palagrahi. How are you? I'm good, my dear. How are you? I'm oh, good. Thanks so much for joining. You're welcome. I remember Enid's face from last time, right? Oh, you do? Yeah. <laughs> how are you? I'm good. How are yeah, you? Good. Not too bad. Thank you. Okay. I'm so from Ms. NHSW. Ms. Oh, yes. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah. Good, good. Miss Fran, are you on? I see your face, but I don't hear you. Maybe she's coming. Maybe she's on mute. Maybe yeah, it could be she's on mute. She, she'll be the one telling us when we can begin. And, okay. and so Dr. Panagrahi, this is being recorded so we can get to uh, continue to air it, um, which is great. You know, we can get eyes on this outside of this meeting, which is good. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's me trying from another. Oh, I have been putting it from my iPad, I guess. Hold on, hold on. I was trying because, it, you know, this was not letting me in. Oh, uh, when you when you press the link or when you dialed in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I, I put my iPad on it. I think it, my iPad is auto-connecting. Let me just stop. Okay, okay. Hi, Enid. Hi, Miss Flato. How are you? Hi. Um, I it doesn't look like there's a chat box on here. Did you did you uh, notice that? I did notice that, which is unusual because usually there is one. Let's wait till uh, Francesca comes on so we can ask yeah. her what's going Remember on. That happened once before. I do. Didn't put it in, and I, yes, that's that's so true. I think it should be open so that people can drop questions and comments. And you're there. so right. Uh, okay, we'll talk to Miss Fran when she gets on. Yeah. Hi, I have to call him back. Um, so, um, I think that the, the our chat was kind of. Um, Disabled for reasons. Mm. Um, when we're having our meetings, I'm assuming that's the reason why. So, 
So um, I know, I don't know if Mia can, Mia, are you there? I don't know who from the board is. Um... It's Khalid, friend. Mia yeah, is Khalid. monitoring uh, environmental protection tonight. Mm -hmm. Yes, but in regarding the chat, yeah, the chat was disabled uh, because the chat was used inappropriately and uh, yeah. district staff found that it was more appropriate to uh, limit the chat because it's just been essentially abused. But yes, we do acknowledge that, you know, information is shared from the chat. So if you do want to reach out to a particular individual, um, taking the time to gather that information, of course, feel free to do that. But if, if there's anything other in particular that you want shared to like the community, uh, you can always just feel free to email the CB9 uh, office email, which is bk09-1 at cb.nyc.gov. Um, so yeah, as, as um, Philip says, so if for any reason, anyone have any information during the course of the presentation or the meeting, um, you can always let us know, you know, um, raise your hand or just interrupt and let us know that you have a question or you have, you know, a comment because this is the Zoom link that we use for our general board meeting. And then we were having a lot of interruptions and a lot of things were being placed in the chat that was very inappropriate. So that's the reason why we had to take those steps. Hey, okay. Francisco, it's war. Yes. I'm ready to cope. Why, why do you have a knife in your hand? <laughs> I, 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 have my, I got my food here. I'm ready to cook. <laughs> <laughs> Tahisha has a co-host. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> wow, you know, I was thinking, I said, well, you know, you know, usually it's men month and the presentation tonight really um, for the men. Yep. And I'm like, usually we have more, we always have more, me, more women than men, but at least we have two men representing tonight. I, I'm, I'm looking, I'm not sure if we have any, any more, but I know definitely we have Warren and we have Mr. Almonar. Yeah. Who is coming in now? So and we have, have Khalid. Khalid too. And we have and we have Khalid. Khalid. And Khalid. Yeah. yeah, and we have Khalid. So yeah. Well, the woman could always take uh, the the recipes to their men. <laughs> right, know. Tahisha, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, Warren's getting ready. <laughs> Warren, Warren is getting ready. And um Warren has already volunteered himself for the next um cooking that he will be doing the cooking. He wants to be the chef. Oh, good. All right. Uh, he, he says he wants to do his um, conflicts chicken, you said? Yeah, yeah, it's called Cooking with Warren and it is very healthy. And it's baked chicken. Uh, it's baked Southern fried chicken and it's delicious. Okay. Well, so I'm now we have six. i have to get something else, you know? We have 606. And I am so thrilled. I am so happy to see. Um, I was very concerned because I know of the time change from seven o'clock to six um, to six p.m. That you know people will may not be able to you know conflict with people's schedule. So I am thrilled. I am very happy to see um, so many of you here with us tonight. And as you know, our, our healthy cooking and COVID. This is our second run at it, and we will, as well, we, I think we'll continue it for, for a while and do not change in the, 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 the theme. And um, so that this segment, we will have our, our first presentation after the presentation for 15 minutes, after which will be um, from the doctor. And then we will have our chef come on. And then after our chef, then we'll have another short presentation and for all community members, uh, we will stay on the same line and we'll go right into a short meeting as to what we have coming up to this uh, discussion. So I am so happy. So it's a thrill to see so many of you. Um, those of you who are regulars, um, I'm happy that you're here with us. You're safe. You're in good spirit. You're in good health. And without further ado, I would like to, I will turn the floor over to 
Ms. Dillard, where she will come in and introduce our first presenter. Thank you all so much. And again, as Ms. Fran was saying, I call her Ms. Fran so lovingly. Um, we're so glad to see everybody on the call this evening and really are enjoying, we are very much enjoying from one Brooklyn Health perspective, working with Community Board 9 on such programming for the community in terms of education and cooking. We also wanna thank uh, Ms. Flateau for all that she has been doing too, to join with us, to work with us on this as best possible. And tonight, what we have done is a, a collective group. We've discussed the importance of bringing together uh, wellness education, cooking education, and men's health. And uh, for all the ladies on the call this evening, please feel free to take any information back to your husbands and or significant others, or prepare this meal with them, maybe for Father's Day or coming close for an activity, or just tell a friend. Um, tonight, we have someone very special with us. She is always very willing to work with the community. She is a very gifted physician, very versed, and works in our outpatient uh, specialty center at uh, Kingsbrook at One Brooklyn Health. And her day, name is Dr. Panagrahi. She does a lot of education in the community and is very, very focused on men's health and was very excited to do this presentation tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Panagrahi. Thank you, Enid, and thank you everyone for having me. Uh, like you say, you save the best for last. So we'll finish with the dry topic and the disease stuff, and then we'll keep the cooking for the end so we can have some fun. We can end it with a nice thing. So um, like Enid told me that we'll be talking a little bit about men's health in particular, we'll be focusing on prostate cancer. So I have a slide I would like to share with you guys. Can I share the slide with you? Uh, let's see. I think the slide share is available, but it says the host has to, I think, uh, allow it. Let's see if... Uh... It says friendly host, I'm making it all participants and all participants. I don't know if that will work. I tried to do it. Ms. Fran, are you a host? I've yeah, made, yeah, yeah. Okay. I've made I, a doctor host. Yes. yes, okay. Thank you, thank you so much. Can you see my slides? Yep. I think it's always better with slides, otherwise it looks pretty dry. All right. So uh, basically men's health, before we start talking about prostate in general, I just want to like share that actually the most common cause of death in men is heart disease and um, uh, also uh, closely followed by cancer. And uh, when it comes to cancer, the most common is prostate cancer followed by colorectal cancer, uh, sorry, followed by lung cancer, then you have colon cancer, uh, then uh, we have uh, bladder cancer and finally melanoma, that is a skin cancer. So these are some of the common cancers, the top five, I would say, that uh, cause, uh, you know, that men, men uh, get cancers of. So before we start today, as like we said, we'll be focusing on uh, prostate health. So just to give a quick um, review. So like you see in this picture, you see the bladder, right? And just below the bladder is the prostate. And it is an organ that kind of forms a ring around the urethra near its connection with the bladder. And the urethra, like you see this one, it basically uh, is the tube that carries urine from uh, the bladder to the outside of the body. So this is the exact location of the uh, mm, uh, prostate. So what are some of the diseases that can happen to the prostate? So it can be enlarged. Uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, medically speaking, we say it's a benign prostatic hyperplasia, or you say that it's like BPH. Uh, the second most common thing you can see is prostatitis, and then of course, prostate cancer. So uh, I'll start with prostatitis because there's, you don't need to be like literally aware of it. You will be in pain and you will get help. But these uh, BPH and prostate cancer, they are like uh, more silent. And we'll talk a little bit about how both of these affect uh, the prostate. So like you see the normal size, right? This is the normal size of the prostate. And like you see the location here, there is the bladder, here is the rectum, you see the urethra. So what happens when there is BPH? BPH, if I break it down, it's B for benign, P for prostate, and H for hyperplasia. What do you understand with hyperplasia? Hyperplasia means there are more cells than normal. 
So that, that is uh, called benign prostatic hyperplasia, which means that the prostate is just growing in size. When you hear the term benign, it's a good thing. Benign means not cancer. So BPH can lead to bladder outlet obstruction, which is called BOO in medical terminologies. So what happens is, I'll, I'll show you a picture. Let me go back. Um, you see the urethra, right? So the prostate, the prostate kind of uh, circles around the urethra. So if the prostate grows in size, it starts to press on the urethra and that's how they get obstruction and they have difficulty in urinating. So let me talk a little bit about some facts about BPH. The likelihood of developing an enlarged prostate, it increases with age. It is so common that it is not, if you will have it, the men usually will have it if they live long enough. So a small amount of the prostate enlargement is present in many men over 40 and around by the time they reach 80, almost all of them have it, like more than 90% of them have it. There has been no risk factors that we have found, um, no, like uh, other than normally functioning uh, testicles uh, that uh, secret testosterone. So this is how, if you look at it, the normal prostate, if you see the arrow, I've tried to show, if you look here, the norm, this is the normal prostate. And in the second picture, you see how the prostate is enlarged. Uh, as the prostate enlarges, like you see in this one also, a normal one and an enlarged one, the pressure it puts on the urethra and this causes the urinary problems. So sometimes the patients come and they ask like, you know, does when you say I have BPH, does it mean that I have prostate cancer? Well, the answer to that is no. BPH, like I said, is benign. It is not prostate cancer. It does not cause prostate cancer. However, the symptoms are similar to that of cancer and it may coexist with prostate cancer. The test that we, the screening test that we do to detect prostate cancer is called PSA, but that does not help us distinguish between BPH and prostate cancer. Like, and both BPH and prostate cancer can have elevated enzymes. So what are some of the symptoms? They are frequent urination during the day or the night, and there is a certain urge to urinate uh, when they do pass urine, they may have burning sensation, there may be pain, the flow of the urine may be weak, uh, sensation of the bladder is not empty, like they go to the bathroom, they come back and they feel like they're still not empty. Sometimes there will be inability to urinate, like initiate uh, a urine stream of urine. And sometimes they will have trouble stopping uh, the urine flow once they have started uh, urinating. So these are some of the symptoms. So does it affect the quality of life? Yes, of course it does. And how did we find out that what are the kinds? Like these are some of the things that we found that uh, sometimes patients like 34.7% of the people, this data is taken from CDC and uh, some other websites on uh, American Cancer Society. So from these, we figured out like, you know, that uh, most of them have to limit fluid intake before bedtime. They have to avoid places without toilets. And that's why they try to limit fluid intake before traveling. Sometimes they wake up in the middle of the night to pass the urine and unable to go back to sleep. Um, sometimes they can't even drive for like two hours at a stretch because they have to go to the bathroom. So these are all the impact on the uh, quality of life. So what can we do? There, are, there is treatment available, both medical treatment, there is surgery, there is also invasive surgery. Usually for BPH, we don't need to go that far. Usually it uh, responds very well to uh, medications. So if uh, the reason the men need to be aware of is that if they have any of these symptoms, they should make it a point to speak to their doctor and uh, so that these issues can be addressed. So now we will talk a little bit about prostate cancer. So if you see, this is a normal prostate, the top one and the one below is cancer. So what is some of what are some of the most common uh, you know screening methods that there is basically two of them uh, PSA and a digital rectal exam uh, and usually there is no concrete guidelines when you should start screening for prostate cancer um, usually uh, it is a decision a shared decision that is taken between the patient and the physician people before uh, men above the age of fifty for average risk men. Um, uh, and for 45, uh, uh, men above the age of 45, if they are at high risk, and this includes African-Americans and those with a family uh, member, like a father, a brother, or a son with prostate cancer. And, uh, uh, and then there is uh, the USPSTF, they 
guidelines say that it may be appropriate for some men to be tested between the age of 55 and 69 if it is uh, fits certain criteria. So the two tests, like I said, is the PSA and the digital little exam. But like I said, this, these tests, unfortunately, are not very accurate. So uh, can you get an abnormal PSA and an abnormal digital rectal exam um, even if you don't have uh, prostate cancer? Yes, absolutely. It is possible to get that if you have an infection, if you have BPH. So how do you really, uh, when do you decide uh, whether you have cancer or not? When do you decide what you should do? Uh, and when do you decide whether you should be tested or not? So that is very specific, uh, it's very uh, individualized, which is why men need to be aware of their symptoms and men need to be aware of what are their own uh, wishes, like what is it that they, they, they are looking for? So basically the American Urological Association, there is, if you go and Google it, you will find the prostate cancer screening uh, tool. Uh, then. Uh, once you do the, uh, you know, you answer the questionnaire over there, you can share the results with your healthcare provider when you talk about the benefits and risks of screening. So this is what it looks like when you put it on Google. This is the table. And it has a couple of questions like you see incomplete emptying, frequency, intermittency, intermittency, urgency, weak streams, training. So you answer to them and you see that what is your total score? So based on the scores, you take this to your doctor and you can actually make a shared decision whether screening is okay for you or not. So what are some of the drawbacks? Why is it that the government has no clear guidelines? That is because there are many false positives. What it causes, it, it causes anxiety. Um, and sometimes uh, the cancer, prostate cancer, sometimes they are not really that uh, fast growing. They may not really cause that much harm, but once you diagnose them, you might have to do an intervention which may have some side effects, which is why you need to speak to your doctor and make an individualized plan based on your, uh, your own assessment, where your own, own needs and make a decision whether you would like to be tested or not. Having said that, if the, diagnose, if the cancer is diagnosed at an early age, that makes it a lot easier to actually save a life. I mean, the survival, five-year survival is going to be 100% if it is diagnosed early and an intervention is done. So what are some of the risk factors? Like uh, some of them is like most common, I would say age. Very rare below the age of 40, as you get to 50, you, you know, the risk goes up. Above 65 is more common. Ethnic background, African-Americans more common than Hispanics, African-Americans more common than Caucasians, African-Americans more common than anyone else. And it has also been noted that people having been diagnosed, not only is prostate cancer more common in African-Americans, African-Americans are more common uh, uh, to die uh, of prostate cancer than other ethnic groups. The other thing, family medical history. So if a patient uh, comes to uh, us and tells us that the, his father or his brother uh, um, you know, had a history of prostate cancer, especially if at an early age, that puts them in high risk. And then we make a decision to screen them. It, it's okay to screen them. And also sometimes the men in their families will come and tell you when, uh, that's why when we see a patient, we usually ask them any other cancer in your family. Uh, there seems to be a correlation if somebody in their family has a breast cancer or an ovarian cancer and have some gene mutations, then they may, they may also put them at a high risk for uh, prostate cancer. Diet is something that uh, not adequate evidence, but a uh, heart healthy uh, cancer conscious uh, diet is always good. Um, uh, we do not find like a very strong correlation, but in general, a proper diet can, uh, you know, really help. Let me uh, talk a little bit about what are the symptoms that you should be looking out for and when you should talk to your doctor. So if they have, if the patient, if you have a dull pain in your lower pelvic area, if you feel like going to the bathroom frequently, if there is trouble urinating, if there is pain, if there is blood in the urine, if the ejaculation is painful, if there is pain in the lower back, hips, upper thighs, most importantly, if at any time you lose an appetite and you're losing weight without trying, if you're trying to lose weight, that's a different thing altogether. But if you are losing weight without trying and you're losing appetite and you're having bone pain, that is a strong indication that there's something wrong in general. So you should have a general checkup. Prostate cancer screening may be one of them. And bone pain is not a good sign. It may mean that the cancer has spread above, uh, beyond the prostate, has gone up to the bones. So PSA, like, like I said, is a blood test. It is not very, uh, very accurate. It may be positive in an infection. It may be positive in a BPH. 
but having said that, if the PSA levels are above a certain level, that means there is a risk of cancer. And based on the other factors that we discussed now, the doctor and the patient can make a shared decision um, whether to, you know, how to proceed. Uh, also bear in mind that sometimes patients are on some medications for BPH and that can actually, the patient may have cancer and the PSA levels may still be low. So it's very important to let the doctor know about what medications, because sometimes you come to the internist, the internist knows all the medications, but when they go to the urologist, they do not mention the medications that they are taking. This will cause a false low level and a cancer may be missed. So after you decide with your doctor and that you want to proceed with your biopsy, like you see in this picture, there is a needle that they go by the rectum and a piece of the, this thing is taken, prostate is taken and it is looked at under the microscope. And uh, the bio, so that, that, that is going to give them a better idea if it's a slow progressing cancer or is it aggressive? And based on that, there will be treatment that will be uh, discussed. So there is how do they, when they took it, this is how it looks like under the microscope at the different levels. So this is how they're going to figure out if it is a gliazin score of, uh, these are like terminologies. I mean, they might sound a, sound a bit high flown. So I'm going to make it very simple. So there will be five grades based on um, how bad they are. And the higher the score, the worse it is. So based on this, if you just see this, this might look interesting. This is how under the microscope a benign prostate hyperplasia looks on the left. And on the right side, this is just one of the kinds of prostate adenocarcinoma looks under the microscope. So when we, the pathologist looks at it under the microscope, you see this is how the gliazin score, and then they looked at it under the microscope. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, they, will, uh, they will know how aggressive the tumor is. So after they do the biopsy, the doctor may tell you that we may need a CT scan or an MRI scan to find out where what, what exactly is happening. So if you look at this one, you see this pink thing in the center, that is the prostate. And on top of the pink thing, there is a green kidney shaped thing, that is the cancer. So uh, the radiologist is going to have a look at it and find out, figure out what's happening. And then after that, they stage the cancer. They, the, when you say stage it, they mean that small, is it inside the prostate? Has it gone to the surrounding tissue? Has it gone just to the nearby organs or has it gone far off to the bones, to the lymph nodes or whatever? So the higher the stage, the worse it is. And based on that, we will figure out how to treat. So a couple of treatments. Like I said, the PSA levels, not very accurate. Sometimes if the person just has a very, you know, no symptoms at all, or, you know, very, very individualized. You just have a discussion with your doctor. Sometimes, many times, actually, the doctor may say, well, it looks like it's not a very high grade cancer because sometimes it's just so slow growing that it's not worth making any strong intervention that could potentially cause more side effects like erectile dysfunction or other in symptoms. So you may just choose to just wait and do surveillance, like, you know, just keep testing, see how high the levels are going on or something, uh, you know based on an individual, uh, the individual's uh, decision. The other thing that they can do is radiation. Like if you see in this picture, the radiation is of two types. One is from an external source and they will put send the radiation uh, to the organ. And then the other one is that they have some seeds uh, radiologically, you know, they are activated and they are placed inside the prostate. So they continue continuously radiate that small area. Uh, surgery is an option. Um, so radical prostatectomy, if it is a high growing, you know, very fast growing or aggressive tumor, the doctor may uh, want you to go for surgery. Uh, the other thing is hormone therapy. Uh, so the reason it is used, like I said, that uh, as we know of the risk factor is just a normally functioning uh, testicles that they have testosterone. So the hormone therapy will slow the growth of cancer, but it is never used alone. It will be used with something else. Um, uh, but the side effects are there. Like they have patients usually complain of uh, hot flashes, weight gain, uh, you know, gynecomastia, that's the breasts grow in size. Chemotherapy, not very commonly used in prostate cancer. Uh, only time it is used is that hormone therapy is not working and, uh, and the cancer has really spread out. Uh, Cryotherapy, again, not very common, uh, but it freezes the cancerous cells inside the prostate uh, and it is less invasive than surgery, but it's not widely used. But this is also an option that the patients can discuss with their urologists. 
then there is this vaccine. This is uh, not for prevention. This is for treatment. So basically what they do is they take out the, uh, you know, uh, the immune cells are removed from the blood, they're activated to fight the cancer and they put back into the patient's blood. So this is not very common, but this, this is an option that your doctor will discuss with you uh, if the need arises. Um, finally, food, uh, cancer conscious diet, like I mentioned in the beginning, is the best choice for survivors who want to boost their health. Uh, five or more uh, fruits and veggies a day, then um, limit high fat meat, uh, limit uh, or you know um, processed uh, processed food. Limit alcohol intake to one to two drinks a day, if at all you have to drink no more than that. So these are some of the uh, things. Uh, one more thing I would like to mention here is sometimes you know people are told that there's some herbal supplements uh, and uh, some vitamins that can help or treat. Uh, prostate cancer, there is no evidence to show that, like very concrete evidence. So I think uh, things come up all the time. So I think the best person that if you want to be on any supplements or any vitamins uh, specifically for this, it's always a good idea to talk to your doctor based on your individual history, your individual case, that decision can be a shared decision. Uh, these are some of the sources I've mentioned here, like, you know, you can go to uh, cancer.org or uh, 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 CDC data is also the American Cancer Society is a very good resource. I think these are some of the resources that you could use. And uh, like uh, Inid is going to give you a flyer also, I think at the end where we can have the urologists that we have here who deal with these issues. And uh, this is the number for the hospital. You might want to call if you want to make an appointment with the urologist. They can assist you further with that. Uh, so this was in brief. Rise and give them. Rise uh -uh. As for brave immigrant safety and empowerment. Seems like someone is not muted on the call. Dr. Panagrahi, are you done with your presentation? I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Oh, I am done. I'm done, Ina. Okay. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And thank you so much for joining. Ms. Fran, are we thank taking you. questions at this point or? Yeah, if anyone have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions. Hi, it's Warren. Uh, first of all, doctor, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I had a lot of questions about prostrate and, you know, I'm obviously a senior man, so I have a couple of years, so I get it. No. But anyway, um, I just want to thank you because I didn't understand a lot about those things. Uh, I do have, and I'll, I'll be happy to say this, I, I do have some prostrate issues and I'm being treated with medication, which seems to be working fine. Perfect, and, that's uh, great. Yeah, and since that's occurred, I've been going twice a year to my urologist just for, you know, a checkup. So I want to thank you, and it was just terrific and informative. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, so my question, um, how does, I know you, you spoke about um, erectile dysfunction and ejaculation in men and stuff like that. How does if that should occur in a man, is what type of, of treatment do they get? So that is again, based on a lot of things, like there are medications, uh, pills, but then again, uh, not everyone is uh, uh, eligible for those medications based on what other medications they're taking, based on if their blood pressure is low, based on if they have any heart disease, so they cannot take them. So there is a lot of issues uh, uh, to take into consideration. And if they are eligible for medications, they can do that. The other option is uh, pump devices that are available, vacuum pumps and all. So the urologist can talk in detail with them about that. And then there are other options like surgery also, uh, implants and all. Uh, but then that, uh, that becomes highly specialized based on the kind of uh, issues they have. So they have to have a conversation and there'll be more investigation uh, than, than they can reach uh, which exact treatment to take. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Pamagrahi? 
Well, I think there is none. And Dr. Panagrahi, we want to thank you so much as always for being such a steward of great information to the community. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope you stay on with us for the cooking. <laughs> I, thank you. I, I'll come for dinner. Okay, <laughs> good. What, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So at this Have a time, night. Thank you, Dr. Panagrahi. So at this time, we'd like to invite our cooking. I think that Dr. Panagrahi ended on a wonderful note when she talked about uh, having a healthy diet in, in uh, persons who have cancer, but just in general. And tonight, uh, our chef, Tahisha Salajas, is going to uh, definitely be uh, demonstrating a healthy meal. I think she's going to be doing a vegan meal, which is vegetable-based, which is wonderful, which can be sided with a number of proteins. It'll be very, very healthy for everyone. But uh, Tahisha, I think you are on. I just want you to unveil yourself. Hello, everyone. How Hi. are you? Hi, Tahisha. How are you? So let me just I'm give you great. the proper introduction. Uh, Tahisha is uh, the marketing coordinator at Kingsbrook at One Brooklyn Health, and that is because she's wonderful at marketing and she's wonderful at community engagement, but Tahisha is also the head chef of her own catering business, Creole Spice, and she's also um, a very, very talented chef that's been featured on The Chew, as well as the American Family Cookout on ABC. I think you're probably going to do the American Family Cookout again in November, if, if I'm not mistaken, right, Tahisha, you and your family. God willing, God willing. Absolutely. So we just want to invite you and thank you and take it away, Tahisha. All right. Hello, Community Board 9 family. I, it's an honor once again for me to be with you all. It is Men's Health Month. And of course, I'm a female, but um, <laughs> I'm married to an incredible man and I have two sons, no daughters yet. And of course, I have a dad and uncle. So as women, right, men will always be a part of our lives. So this is a great opportunity, ladies or men, to take uh, full advantage of this opportunity to learn this delicious menu or this delicious dish, I should say, that I have prepared for you guys. So today we're going to do something It's going to be eggplant-based. Thank, thank you once again for having me, and thank you, Enid, for that wonderful introduction. So um, we're going to get right into it. So I think I saw some of you guys had a um, had uh, like their knives are ready to cook. Whoever um, is that member still there? I hope you got some eggplant in your kitchen because um, our dish today is going to be eggplant baked. Okay, can you guys hear me well? Yes, yes. Okay, awesome, awesome. So um, today I'm going to prepare for you guys, and you can prepare with me if you have these ingredients. I'm going to take you through the ingredients. Um, it's going to be a baked eggplant, a stuffed baked eggplant, okay? And whatever is in it, the, the, the wonderful thing about this dish is very versatile. If you don't like mushrooms, you don't have to put mushrooms. If you don't like certain things, you don't have to put it. Whatever you want to use, you can use vegetable base. However, the foundation will all be the same. The steps will always be the same. And it's very easy. And if you're a mom like me that don't want to like do a 50 hour course in the kitchen, <laughs> and this is a perfect dish for you guys um, to, to really learn and to really hopefully replicate at home. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to be introduced to all of our ingredients. And of course, the star of the ingredient, the star of the dish is going to be eggplant. So um, I'm just going to take you because, you know, we're not on set. This is live at home. So I'm just going to switch my camera here and I'm going to show you guys what I have laid out here. So this is an eggplant. All I did was I cut it in half and I took the pit out. OK, I took the pit out and I did not throw it out. I put it on the side and I have here some extra virgin olive oil. I have some red onions chopped up. I have some pimento pepper and banana pepper for all my Caribbean people. How you guys doing? Okay. And I have here some minced garlic and I have here the pit inside of the eggplant and I have some made already couscous and here I have some tomato paste. Okay. So um, I will be sending this recipe to, um, to you guys after so you guys can replicate and um, yeah, and enjoy. So the first thing we're gonna do is, so here I have my eggplant. It's been cut already, it's been pit out. Because of time, all I did was I scooped out all of the inside, but leaving it about a quarter inch or so, okay? Just enough because we're gonna make this in the oven. So what we're gonna roast it in the oven. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove, gently remove the inside, not too close to the skin. And we're just gonna set it aside here and we're gonna put it in our bowl. 
Okay, once that's done, we're gonna put the star of the dish, we're gonna dress up the star of the dish first, then we're gonna put it in the oven and we're gonna let that roast while we do the other, while we do the inside, the goodness, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is, here I have about a couple uh, tablespoons of olive oil I'm going to drill. If you have a brush, this works too, but I just moved into this house, so I don't know what my brush is, so spoon is gonna do for me today. How you doing? Okay, great. So, <laughs> So here I have a spoon. I'm just brushing in. Actually, a spoon works very well. You'll be surprised. Sometimes you don't have to get all those fancy gadgets, okay? But um, if you if you want to, if you do, then you can use them. Um, so I have some extra virgin olive oil. Just brush it really well. Take your time and brush it, okay? You can add some salt and pepper on top to flavor, to taste. Um, but the flavoring inside is going to have so much flavor. Salt is really not necessary on the outside. However, if you choose, you just brush it up with some salt and um, add some salt in there. Another thing you can do is you can also flavor your oil. What do I mean by that? You add a little salt and pepper in your oil. You let it soak in some rosemary and some thyme and some herbs, and you let it sit uh, for a couple of days. When you taste that, it's gonna be, you can use it for meat, you can use it for any vegetable you want, and you have flavored olive oil, okay? And there you go. So here I have this beautifully covered eggplant, okay? You can rub the outside just to make it nice and pretty, okay? And I'm gonna put in my oven, please hold. <laughs> so I have it about 450, okay? So what I'm gonna do now, we're gonna go to the stove top and we're gonna put all this goodness together. We're gonna put the couscous together. We're gonna put the couscous with the, um, with the, with the, um, with the tomato paste and the olive oil and the onions and the garlic. I mean, just talking about it, it's just making an aroma. So let's go to the to the stove top, shall we? All right, great, perfect. All right. So this is the second step to this dish. So all you want to do is in a medium pan like this, you want to heat it up, medium high, and then you're gonna start. So you're gonna start bringing your ingredients together. You're gonna to let the pan warm and you're gonna start bringing your ingredients together. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start the base. A good base is always gonna have some type of fat, some type of healthy fat. So we're gonna start with some olive oil. This is about two to three tablespoons of olive oil. If you don't have something to measure, you can just do three rounds very lightly and that, that will give you about two to three tablespoons of olive oil. So in here, I have my olive oil. I'm gonna add my garlic, two tablespoons of garlic. That may sound like a lot of garlic, but it is going to help this dish a lot. I could smell it already. I like a lot of garlic, so, all right. Now what's gonna happen is if your pan is really hot, your oil and your garlic is gonna to come to the fact of a, a, a browning. What happened is the reason why it browns or caramelizes is because usually the sugar is meeting with the oil and it's causing this browning to happen. So that's perfectly fine, as long as it's not burning. Okay, great. So, um, I'm gonna put this all right, fire up here. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to start adding our onions. I'm gonna add that note in there. And we're gonna add pepper, pimento pepper. So a little bit about pimento pepper. It is not hot, it, it's a sweet pepper, but it has a nice smokiness to it. So if you're from the Caribbean, if you ever use pimento pepper before, you're probably gonna understand what I'm saying. And um, yeah, so we're gonna let that come to a nice simmer. What I mean is, I'll take, I'll take you to, um, I'll make you see how this pan is looking right now. When the onions are nice and translucent, then you know the base is ready. So while that cooks in a separate pot, you wanna put about a quarter cup of water with some salt, all right? And remember that inside of the eggplant that I told you not to throw out, where it's gonna go into the pot and it's gonna boil just a little bit. And we're gonna let that come to boil. If you guys could just smell my kitchen. Okay, anybody wanna come smell? Cause it's smelling good up in here. So, okay. So then we're gonna put a little bonnet pepper. Now with my bonnet pepper, there's two things you can do. You can either poke cloves into it. So the cloves, if you don't like the taste of cloves, so it's not scattered in your food, or if you don't wanna use cloves at all, 
you can just cut a, the, just the tip of it just so you get a little bit of heat. If you don't want much heat, but you want the smokiness of the bonnet, you put it whole, you drop it right there, and you keep it moving. <laughs> All right. Anybody got any questions? Are you guys watching? Let me know you're here. We're here. We're watching. We're watching. Right. <laughs> when did the chef was watching before? Anybody have any questions while this, this comes to a boil? Anybody have any questions? No questions at all? Do you guys like you think? No, hi, hi, it's Warren. What's a bonnet? Hey, how are you? Uh, good, how are you? I'm great. Uh, when you say there's, you put a, the whole clothing, you take off the skin, right? When you said what, I'm sorry? When you said that you put the whole clothing, what's a bonnet? Oh, a bonnet What's pepper. This is what a bonnet pepper is. So a bonnet pepper oh. is a type of pepper. It's very spicy. So the seeds okay. are very spicy. So to avoid having all that spice and then having acid reflux, right? We don't want that. <laughs> um, I mean, it's up to you if you can tolerate the, the spice. But me, sometimes I really okay. don't like too I'm spicy. Not, I'm not a fan of acid reflux. Okay. I'm not a fan. <laughs> okay, and that's fine. But if you want the smokiness, just a little bit of, of, of heat, when it's not like too hot, you can just put the whole bonnet pepper in there without cutting it. And what that does okay. is usually peppers have oil on the skin. So when that uh -huh. starts to cook, you're cooking the oil on the skin and that has a lot of flavor in it. So it's adding flavor to your base. And this base could be used for anything, soups, rice, meats, but this is a vegetarian dish. So for that reason, we didn't put anything else in there. Okay, thank you. No problem, thank you. So the next thing we're gonna do is, um, let me just show you how um, my onions are being translucent with the garlic and the onions and everything else going on there. So do you guys see that? Yeah. My bonnet pepper is so cool. And here we have all the onions. All right. Great. All right. <laughs> yeah, so just want to add in there so, as 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 you stay um you stay your pot Warren be careful that your spoon don't burst that bonnet pepper. Be careful what? I was telling Warren as you stir when you put that whole bonnet pepper in there and as you stir, just be careful that you don't cut or bust that pepper. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Exactly. I'll practice. If, if it's cut or if it's bust, what's going to happen is then you're going to really feel the heat. Yeah. There's a trick to that though. Put a little brown sugar and it should calm down the heat, but just avoid it. It's even better. <laughs> so here I have a little bit of um, tomato paste. What I have here, I'm going to just put it in there just to give it some color. And it's going to give this some really nice color. And I'm going to put the couscous now. This is about a cup of couscous. It's already cooked. Couscous takes 10 minutes to cook. It is the most easiest thing I think there is to cook and it's healthy for you. Um, it takes about 10 minutes, really. Two cups of water, one cup of couscous. After 10 minutes, you take it out, you fluff it with a fork, salt and pepper, and you call it a day. It's really not that hard to make at all. But because of time, I know we don't have like a whole hour. So I pre-cooked a, a couple of things here for the sake of time. So. Um, so you just take the couscous and you just press it on in. So rather than using pasta shells and you know uh, different things like that, we're using the couscous to give our dish some flavor, some to give it some, some dimension. So I'm gonna just show you what that couscous looks like. All right, so while that cooks, I'm gonna check the eggplant. I'm gonna show you guys what this looks like. All right. All 
perfect. <laughs> Hopefully one day I can have a full set, you know, a production set that can just switch cameras for me. <laughs> but um, but yes. So while this is cooking, all the flavors, everything else is going into it. Um, the flavors, we have the garlic, we have the couscous that has salt already, which is why you see I didn't dress it up with salt and pepper because the couscous has salt, it has pepper. And then you have the extra pimento pepper, the onion, the garlic. And if you are someone that has like, you know, like a lot of my family members have hypertension or they cannot take too much salt, but the herbs itself, like the, 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 um, the, the spices that you use, like the garlic and the onions, those things are very flavorful. So I'm gonna let this cook, it's gonna come to cook. And now a little bit I'm gonna um, add here is, I'm gonna add some garlic powder and I'm gonna add some, um, uh, I'm gonna add some parsley and I'm gonna add some Italian seasoning. So for those that were in the last class, Italian seasoning, I don't know if anybody was listening, Italian seasoning has different herbs in it already pre-mixed in for you. So you don't really have to like, you know, find your herbs separately to, um, you know, to put it in. But Italian seasoning has rosemary, has thyme, has sage, has basil, all ready mixed in. So you put all that green in there. What's going to do, it's also going to give a lot of color. Okay. And it's just... Now, my eggplant is almost done coming to boil. It's well, it already came to boil. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take some of the water that the eggplant was cooking in, and I'm just going to add to the base of the couscous and the tomato sauce. I'm just going to add this to the base right here. Okay. Okay. I'm going to let. I'm going to check the plant. Looking good. Looking good. Looking good. Hot, but it's looking good. Okay. So, this is going to be really hot. So, all you're going to do now, you're going to take the eggplant that was boiling. You're gonna put it in here. Can you guys see that? Okay. And you're just gonna take a spoon and you're gonna mash it. If I have any Haitians on the phone, mashing eggplant is something that's a staple in our culture. It's called legume. And it's usually made with different meats or just veggies, but then you mash it. And we usually mash it in a pilon, we call pilon, a malter. And you just um, kind of mash it like that and it gives it this nice texture and you guys will see what the texture looks like. So you just match it because it's really now really well done. Okay. So now that's mashed, I'm gonna show you guys how that looks. So you have the couscous, you have the eggplant, you have the sauteed onions and the garlic and the olive oil, the pimento pepper and a little bit of bonnet. Okay. Perfect. So all we're gonna do to miss our Mr. Eggplant, this is the finale. And then you put it back in the oven or the finale, you, you really enjoying it. And you're just gonna stuff it. And this could be, listen guys, this could be a romantic dish, a healthy romantic dish, just because of the body that this eggplant is in. It's so beautiful. You wanna make sure you coat it and just, all right. Now, if you are a breadcrumbs person, you can put some panko on top of it, okay? If you don't want to do carbs, if you want this completely to be a carb, uh, a, a low carb, then you just want the couscous, then you could just leave that too. And you just dress it up like this. Can everybody see that? I hope that's a yes. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Perfect. Now I'm going to just dress a little bit of olive oil again. And I'm going to finish it with some parsley. And after this, you just put this in the oven right back in a 450 degrees for about 20 minutes or until the top is nice and golden brown and you're ready to eat it. So we're gonna put it in the oven. And there you go. You have a stuffed eggplant that is dressed in its goodness. And that is gonna be so delicious by the time your meeting finishes. But that is our meal for today stuffed eggplant. So we're gonna leave it to bake for about 20 minutes or so. Once it's golden brown, it's gonna come out and it's going to be perfect. Thank you, Tahisha, that looks fat. Oh, now I really wanna make that. I'm hungry. <laughs> oh my question. Can you substitute uh, cornmeal or rice for the couscous? You can, but if you're really trying to stay away from rice, like a lot of my family members are trying to stay, I'm trying to stay away from. <laughs> but yes, you can use rice. You can use orzo, you can use rice, you can use anything, any type of grain you want. You yeah, can use quinoa, bulgur. No, you could use quinoa or some stuff like that too. You can use quinoa, you can mm -hmm. use bulgur, okay, the wheat, you can use that. And you can substitute it for any grain you really want. I just chose couscous because I like the texture, the little round texture that it has. It mm -hmm. just really gives um, the eggplant some body. And because because um, eggplant that's smashed is already like, you know, it's very um, loose. So right. the couscous kind of gives it some body and holds it together. Mm -hmm. um, rice could do the same thing, but then you, you get grains and it, sometimes it gets spotty. So mm -hmm. I thought the best grain to do it with was couscous, but you could also do it with bulgur and it will come out the same. Okay. Any other questions for Tahisha on this dish or substitutes that you guys might want to try? Well, I don't think there's any more. I think it was self, very self-explanatory. So what we'll do is, uh, Tahisha, you will, oh, what is that? Is that finished? Yeah, there you go, that's the problem. And there you go. That looks that's great, Tahisha. So will you have a recipe card that maybe we can um, yeah. share with the group? I do maybe? Have a Good. I do have a recipe card. I'll be sending it. And so everybody can have it. Um, I created it. So. Are you there, Tahisha? Or did you press some um, stop video by accident? I think she probably did. Okay, Miss Fran, well, we'll move forward because it's 6.55. I know that Tahisha will definitely supply that card for us later on. Yes, definitely so, definitely. Um, I mean, I am, I am hungry right now. So, me, me <laughs> and, too. I know, <laughs> and I know a whole lot of you sitting there right now, you're left like thinking for those who wrote the recipe down, I know you will try it. Um, and actually, I am not an eggplant person, but I know I, I can substitute, um, with something else and, and make it. I do mix up some eggplants, but I've never made it like this. It looks um, delicious, so I, I definitely will, will try it. Yeah, and, and Ms. Fran, I'm not an eggplant person either, but I'm gonna tell you when I started roasting it in the oven, it does have a bit of a different consistency. You'd be surprised how much you like it. Yeah. Yeah, you just have I, to kind I, of try I, it. Normally I do mine with um, breadcrumbs, but I'll try something right. different to keep stay away from the carbs. Right. You know, right. so <laughs> yeah. So um I think she I don't think she's there now. No, I think I something if... something cut off for her. Something yeah, happened something, to her. But, yeah, it, something but it's okay. We can we can proceed because I know it's coming to meeting time. Yeah. So uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. Please stay on to the meet on the meeting. If you have any questions, if you have um if you have any suggestions as we move on into our meeting. Um, please stay on if you have to go, it is fine, but um, I, I would be very happy if you could stay on with us. If you have any questions, Ms. Blair, it is um, um, wonderful to see you. 
and, and everyone else, welcome. I know I'm seeing some faces that I have seen before. So it's so good to see you and welcome Ms. Plato and all my other colleagues. So now I'll pass it on over to and um, Kim. It's good to see you as well. I've been wanting to call you, but um, and from from uh, for some of you who are he here, and I always say that um, anytime you come on this platform, you are family. And I just want to thank um, Miss um, Miss Dillard. Um, May 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 twelfth. Um, I think some of you would have heard that there were a few incidents um, and the uh, trains to stabbing in, in Manhattan, one in Brooklyn, and one um, in, the, in Queens. And um, usually I have a devotional group that we meet every morning. Um, when my sister is part of that devotional group and she left home early as anything at this good world. And she left home early to go to the, to the doctor, to the dentist. And by um, 10 to 12, I received a call that she was stabbed. On the on the subway, and um, and her husband called me frantic, you know, going crazy that she was stabbed, and then so she was a person. For any one of you who have would have heard of the incident at the on Pennsylvania Avenue on the three train, she was stabbed on the three train. Um, she had um, he stabbed her twice. She was looking for the train. He walked past very close to her. She turned around and she said sorry, and and he kept he kept moving. He kept walking, he said nothing to her and her attention went back to the tracks looking for the train and she was heading back home from the doctor at 10.30 in the morning. And unknowing to her, he came right back and stabbed her in her back, twice in her back. And then she turned around and faced him and she, she tried to fight him for, um, for, the, um, for the knife. He threw her on the, on the, on the platform and um, then he continued stabbing her. So she got um, four stab wounds two in her back and two in her shoulder, she had a, a, a collapsed lungs. And um, when he got um, loose, the knife got loose from him, he tried to pull her to the traps. But then God is good. God sent someone who screamed at him and then another guy came and they, were, um, they, they chased him away. So I think that morning God, that God had this angel, this special angel there for her because there were men, there were other people on the platform and they pull out their phones and they were just taking videos and pictures and no one went to, to assist her. And um, so I'm very, very happy. The, the, since it happened at um, the Pennsylvania Avenue, so it happened that they took her to, the, to Brookdale Hospital and, um, and she was cared for there. So I just won, I called, Everything was going haywire for me. I was just like going crazy as to what's happening because it's COVID time and there was not, you know, certain protocols that have been held at the hospital. It was very difficult, you know, and why to make it worse when she got there and her daughter got there, which is my niece. Then she had an asthma attack. She collapsed at the hospital. So I had two persons that I had to rush to the hospital for. And eventually I saw... Um, OBH, and I'm sitting, standing in there, and I'm like, OBH. I said, oh, um, I know how I can call. And then I called Miss um, Enid, and then she was grateful enough to get help for me. So that I was able to go into the hospital, I was able to go into the emergency, and I was able to be with her and, and take care of her, and the other people who were able, came to they came to look for me, and they were able to assist her. So I just want to thank Ms. Um, Dillard for your, for your help. And, but most of all, I just, you know, give God thanks and give God praise for really sparing. It could have been worse, you know? And for me, I think that when bad things do happen, when bad things happen, we must always look, look for something good coming out of it, you know? So I just want to thank God for, you know, for her and then for all those who were there for her. So right now I'm going to turn the floor over to Melissa as um, she, we continue our meeting. I just wanted to inform everyone. Go ahead, Melissa. Hi everyone. Hi Fran and um, Fran, I, I, I'm sorry for what happened to your sister, but I'm glad 
you know, by luck, you went ended up um, at one Brooklyn house and Enoch was able to help you. Yeah. Yeah, very lucky. Um, sure. So I wanted to follow up on the conversation that we had last month. Actually, we were we were talking about doing the Juneteenth event um, and the events in the park. So I had reached out to um, the test and trace team to ask about the testing ban. And I just wanted to check in with the group to see if that was something that we were still moving forward with. Somebody's, I got them. I let them in, I, I let them come in. Yeah, I just wanted to like check back in with the group to see like how we're feeling about doing um, that activity on Juneteenth. I believe it was Miss Soul Creary, correct me if I'm wrong, Fran, mm -hmm. that had that Juneteenth event that was planned. But she's not here. So I don't think this yeah, um I, I spoke to um I I spoke to our district manager concerning that because um last month we were giving out some masks. Um you remember where we were doing the mask giveaway yeah. on Fridays and they were supposed to um um Caleb, are you there? Yes, I'm here, friend. So um the, the mask giveaway at the student street um station, did we have the chess and trust people present? Yes, yes, we did that with them. Um, do you know who was it, Miss Waterman? Yes, Monique uh, Waterman. Okay, so to my understanding, that Monique no longer work in that division. Right. I think she have moved on to a different division. Mm -hmm. So what I'm, I'm, I'll touch base with um, the board. I'll touch base with our district manager, and mm -hmm. most likely he'll be able to work out something for us for for that day. Yeah, um... because it's it's on a, it's a Saturday, really. It's a Saturday. Yeah, it's June 19th, so that's a Saturday. I was able um, to get introduced to the, the person that's replacing Denise, the new Brooklyn Borough Director. And okay. she had, so she she wanted me to confirm like whether or not we were moving forward at all. Like that was, that was mm -hmm. meaning like you're willing to bring out the van and they, we would have it available for the entire day, but they just wanted to, and they would take care of any permitting that needed to be done as far as having the van out there or anything like that related to it. They would take care of it was just more a matter of of finding out for sure if that's that's an event that's going to be happening and we can confirm with them yeah um I definitely because uh so she was she was really asking mm -hmm. um so we have to touch base with her to make sure that she haven't made any other um arrangement with them because she did put it through to us as you said at the last meeting to see if we could have that done and any other organization as well. Um, if any of you here um, is from an organization that you may want to do a tabling or anything, because she did ask if any other organization wants to, and it will be Junton on um, Eastern Parkway. Is it Eastern Parkway and Franklin, right, Melissa? Yeah, Eastern Parkway and Franklin Avenue. And Franklin Avenue. So yeah. there would be a food giveaway over there. And then she's asking that if there are other um, other people who wants to come to um, to do you know just to join in. So if you mm -hmm. want to do tabling and showcase in your organization or whatever that you know you're welcome you're welcome to do so. And then then she was asking for the test entries of one to be there as well. Right. So if anyone is interested in doing that, please shoot us um, shoot me an email via the board, and then you will get back to me. And then definitely we'll put you in contact with um with um Sol. Okay. That's fine. So we'll we'll I can send her another email and just make sure that she knows that like we're waiting to hear back from her. So that's right. No problem. Yeah and I can see, mm -hmm. see everybody. The the other thing it wasn't on the agenda, but um I had an experience over the, the weekend, over the holiday weekend, you know, where I had to take a family member to the hospital. Um and I, I shared this with Fran and it was um it was um, it was a pretty uh, stressful situation to begin with, but then when we got there, um, the the hospital staff unfortunately were were not very were not very helpful. And one of the thing you know, I, I, one of the things I wanted to sorry, my um, screen is coming off. Oh, can you see me? Yes, we can. Sorry about that. 
Right. Okay. So we, I had this bad experience at the, the hospital. And what I was realizing is I didn't know for myself and I work for the city. I myself did not know what is the mechanism to, um, you know, to resolve any issue that you have when you are in a hospital, if you're not getting the proper treatment that you need when you enter the hospital. So it took like over two hours before my family member even got seen by a doctor and we were able to you know, get any kind of treatment for them. And I don't want that to ever happen again or to happen to anyone else. So I just wanted to put it out to the group if you know that would be number one, if anyone knows about like what you know, that, that kind of, um, I guess, patient advocacy uh, procedure is, because I have no idea. And the other suggestion was to maybe bring someone in to our next meeting that is a patient advocate that could maybe explain the procedure. Uh, you know, if you have a family member that's in the hospital and they're not getting the treatment that they need, like that's a big, it's a big issue and it's a very sensitive issue. And I myself was a little bit afraid to approach you know, the charge nurse, because this is the people that are taking care of my family member, right? So I'm hoping that um, that I can get in touch with like an advocacy group that could come maybe, be, um, well, I guess July we're off, July and August we're off, but maybe in September, we can have someone come and talk about patient advocacy and um, different ways that we can direct people if they have a situation similar to what I had over the weekend. So Melissa, can I ask what hospital you were, your family member was in? <laughs> they were, it's a hospital in uh, Park Slope. I believe it's called um, New York Presbyterian. Okay, yeah. yeah Presbyterian Hospital. So I, okay. I, we've been to that hospital before mm -hmm. and I don't remember us ever having an experience like that where we had to wait over two hours. I don't know if that's the norm when you go to a hospital, like, is that the norm? You were in the emergency department? In the emergency department, right. Yes, depending upon the flow in the emergency department that day yes. and the severity of who's coming in. Right, uh, so we didn't have to wait very long to get into the emergency department, but it was more about actually getting any kind of treatment, right? I see, Right. after you were about, triaging, uh-huh. Right, 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 right. Like, I don't know what the procedure is once you get in, how long it's supposed to take. So, it, you know, I kind of, I was kind of in a position where it's like, okay, do I complain or is mm -hmm. this the norm or, you know, what do I do in that situation? Mm -hmm. Was the family member hospitalized for a length of time or were they just, were they just in the emergency room for that length of stay and then they left after? Yeah, they ended up staying in the emergency room for about... I want to say in total from about 3 a.m. to about 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. So a good amount, a good amount of time in the hospital. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hospital hospital. Yeah. It really does depend. It's very hard to, to tell as to what that could have been about in terms of flow and what was really preventing them. But I think what's key is always communication, right? That no matter what was happening and maybe there was an influx of, of crises happening at the time, I think it is always about communication and coming back to the family, letting them know what's going on. So we'll talk more. I'll see how we can help in terms of patient advocacy. I know we have somebody as our chief compliance officer that's very, very good with that, as well as our chief experience officer. Um, so we might be able to put a few things together, but we, we should talk because I think that it should be well-rounded. And I think it should come from um, probably a, a, a few different sources in terms of patient advocacy from the hospital side, from the policy side, from the patient experience side, so that people get a very well-rounded and not a one-sided effort in terms of understanding patient advocacy. So we, we'd be helpful in that if you'd like to do it. Great. Thank you so much, Enid. Welcome, yeah. welcome. Um, yeah. I Can I uh, say a few things about this? Yeah, go uh, ahead. This situation is, uh, from my experience, unless you have somebody with a medical background, it's very hard to navigate hospital. It is. I mean, uh, even in the best hospital, I'm even talking about places like Northwell in Long Island. And I even think about the process of putting together an organization that can become a community advocacy for patients 
because unless you have people that are very tenacious and pushy advocating for you, if you have a sick one in hospital, a lot of times it's very difficult to navigate. Now, if you're talking about immigrant population, it's going to be worse. There's language barriers. There's not having the knowledge of what's going on. So if you're lucky, you have some health professional in your family that can advocate for you, you could see the process move a little faster, a little better, even after the person is hospitalized. That is constantly calling the doctor, talking to the nurses, talking to the attending, to the student or whatever. And I think this is something that's lacking. And I think some community work is needed or somebody can develop some kind of a service. And especially if when you get to the elderly, it's going to, it, it get worse. So I think this is something we should think about. And uh, like I said, it, uh, hospitals sometimes get overwhelmed. But if you can get an outside organization that could also help in that, I think this is something we should look into. The place people can call and say, hey, I'm my friend is in the hospital, my family hospital. What can I do? What do I need to do? That information is not out there, unless you have somebody who knows how to navigate this particular system and institution. Right. That's exactly, and that's exactly. something. Another thing that um the last time this that same hospital you were talking about, we had um Cornell and um Presbyterian um <clears throat> Methodist Hospital because Methodist Hospital is not Presbyterian, and then we had a few hospitals. We had a round table, and that's one of the things that I spoke about because I think that uh, you find a lot of health professionals. They do go to school. They have the the, the book smart and everything. But the, um, I think the level of empathy is very, very, very low, you know. And then I think that in healthcare, I mean, I I started doing nursing, and my mom told me, "Hey, you get too too attached to your patients, so you need to step away from that because I'll have to bury you. You will die before me." So I had to step away from it and then um, get into the field where I where I'm in now. And I think that. Um, it shouldn't be who I know or who knows me when I go to see the doctor, right? Each person should get equal, same service as brown, black, whoever it is. I come in for pain. So, so you find sometimes um, health professionals may say to you, well, this person is so miserable. And if that person is harsh and, and, and may have some sort of attitude, then they get less care because of the attitude, but sometimes it's because of what that person is going through, that pain, that agony, whatever that person is going through. And when they go to the hospital, they, they are expecting to get some sort of relief. They're not expecting um, whoever is attending to them to add more. They're not expecting to let, um, be, be neglected. I have experienced it. Mm. I have experienced it whether I just sit there and I just, you know, and I just watch people. And it's the reason why being, um, when I became part on the carbs at Kings County Hospital, that was one of my focus um, patient, especially in the ER, you know, the emergency unit, that was one of my, my um, passion when we had me meetings to um, bring it up because I, I, whatever that experience, I don't want anybody. It's any other hospital that I go to, and I'm happy that other hospitals I've been to, I don't have to go back there. And I'm happy to know that, you know, even when I sit on, uh, sit on those meetings and I talk to them, they take it into consideration, right? And then they, they look into it. And each, each facility, they have to have some, um, some sort of um, education, sessions as to how you treat your patients when they come in. Put yourself in that person's place. You know, how would you want to be treated? How would you want your mother to be treated? How would you want, um, well, on a whole, how would you want to be treated? So how are you treating this person? And I find many a times that um, a lot of people, they do get into the, the, the healthcare business. It's not because of the fact in those people who, who, who become a healthcare worker, they have had um, 
family members who, who died or it was a passion that they wanted to take care of people, you know, and then you could see it in them when they come, you could see the passion in them. They're so caring. And there are some people, it's just a, it's just a paycheck for them. And that poses a lot of problem. And when it comes to emergency rooms, sometimes, as Ms. Dillard said, it's that sometimes they are overwhelmed. Sometimes you have nurses who are working wrong the clock. <laughs> you know, sometimes they are short, short-handed. Sometimes they didn't even get a brick, you know, and they themselves, they are stressed out. They need a brick for themselves, you know, and some and and it becomes overwhelming. You know, so sometimes we you we don't really understand what they are what they are going through. Um, I had an um issues um with my husband, and and when I really looked into it, it came. And one person, I was in the meeting today, and one person made a, a, um, a comment is that the persons who are hired, nurses who are hired by the hospital, you get better care from them than people who you, if you, you find that you have nurses who come in from, from agencies, and the, 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 the care you get from them are totally different from the care you would get from a nurse who is um, hired by the hospital. I know Miss uh, Miss Blair, Miss um, uh, Plato. You could correct me, Miss Blair. Um, you can correct me, but I had that um, experience, and it. And when I investigated, they were like, "No, no, 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 they're not, they are not hired by the hospital. They are just nurses who just come come around." And then you will hear patients are complaining. I said, "You know what? I called um, so long. I have been calling the nurse, and they're just they're talking about the movies, what cool food they are going to cook." where they are going tomorrow, what are they doing there? And you have a patient lying there and calling to go to the bathroom, calling to get some water, calling to get some medication. And they, would, they, they just keep talking. And when I investigated it, I realized these are people who are coming from another job and just coming to feed another hospital, right. you know? So, and I think that um, having sort of advocacy for our community because especially our black and brown community, the care that is rendered, the care that is given, the care that they, they receive at the at some of the facilities, it's um, it it it, it really need to look into. And as you said, Mr. Uh, Ms. Almanar, sometimes you you find people going to the hospital and the language barrier, you know, it poses a very big problem for them as well. But then I don't think as anything as Melissa, you said you kind of, you were kind of timid or you're kind of afraid as to um, approaching somebody and talking to somebody. And if you approach somebody, for me, if you approach somebody with respect, you're supposed to get respect from them. And if you have a family member who, and that goes for any one of us, we have a family member who have some, mm -hmm. who's experiencing some kind of health um, con uh, problems and then you know that person really do need care and after an hour that person haven't seen anyone and an hour and a half you have a right to go to the head nurse or whoever it is and to to let them know to um air your concern and to let them know hey this is this is happening but I for know. our our community we need to stand we need to come together um when it comes to the hospitals when it comes to even the clinics that we go to the, the, all the other little health facilities that not only the big hospitals, but we have so many other doctors' offices and stuff. They are, exp everyone in all the different um, health institutions we have in our neighborhood, our people, they are receiving services that need to, to really move up a notch. And I totally do think that we should have somebody to come in and give us some kind of information as to handle when we face those situations. How to how to handle it, and then as Mr. Almona said, I'd have have a committee on um on um advocacy for our people. Yeah, uh, Miss, go ahead. Yeah, this is Adele. I I I've worked at several major hospitals in in New York City, and I just want to give a couple of tips to to you and um, Melissa and to everybody. First of all, um, there is a patient guest relations or some similar name office at every hospital. They have to have a staff of patient guest uh, relations uh, managers and staff to assist the patients. So you can always request to see 
somebody from the patient relations office. And that person is supposed to act as an advocate on behalf of the patients so that you're not put in a situation where you feel intimidated or, you know, concerned that your your interaction with the nurse or doctor is going to affect the care, you know, of yourself or your loved one. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you should also ask for a patient's bill of rights. That's something that they're supposed to have. It should be posted. It should have a number where you can call to make a complaint if necessary, but you can ask for an actual written copy of the patient's bill of rights. You can also file a complaint within the hospital, um, which would be a formal complaint that has to get answered and it has to be uh, the people involved, you know, have to uh, respond to that complaint. Um, if you don't, if you forget to do that while you're in the hospital, you can also call 311 and make a complaint. And I know for a fact, those complaints actually end up going to the mayor's office and then routed to the hospital. Cause I used to have to respond to those myself sometimes when, when I worked at uh, Kings County. Um, so that's another mechanism to at least have some accountability for what happens. You can call 311 afterwards and then make a complaint through 311. You can also, um, while you're there in the hospital, if it's off hours, you should ask for the administrator on duty. You're supposed to have what's called an AOD, who is the person assigned to help address any kind of issues, you know, patient, patient issues that are taking place during the off hours when the regular administrators are not there. That, that's called the AOD and you should ask to see that person. And in terms of language, the hospital has to have a language bank. So if there is an issue with translation or communication, then again, you should ask to have a, a, a formal translator um, to provide those language services. Those are all legal requirements. It's not just like an optional thing. So it's important to know what your rights are and what, know what resources are there mm -hmm. for you to address the issue at the time, because it's obviously best to address it while you're still there, you know, in the hospital. So those are some things that you should just be aware of, you know, for the future. Right. Right, right, right. And um, I, I, I am aware of the, the guest relations or patient relations. I guess my, my hesitation with approaching them is that they get paid by the hospital at the end of the day. So they're not going to necessarily, to don't, me, at least have yeah. your best interest at heart because they're, they're getting paid by the hospital. So I guess I was trying to look for who is that person outside of the hospital that's independent of the hospital that I can call in that situation or reach out to, you know, in that, you know, if I'm having that type of situation. Well, I, I really don't think you should bypass that person. Yes, they work for the hospital, but their job is to advocate for the patients. So if you're not satisfied with what happens, then that's the point at which you can then make a nine, uh, a 311 call, or you can call the State Department of Health. And that information is supposed to be on the patient bill of rights. So, but you should really start with the person who is assigned to resolve problems. That person knows the hospital best. They probably know the cast of characters that you're dealing with and you should make them accountable. If they don't respond and don't do their job, that's another story, but don't assume just because they work for the hospital that they're not gonna advocate for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fair, that's fair. And um, just to clarify, I did, I spoke to, to several people uh, in that hospital, several people in the nursing unit and the charge nurse. It wasn't until I found a doctor at the doctor station who told me, hey, as you know, actually the doctor put in an order for your, your, uh, your family member, like within 20 minutes of you coming to the hospital actually. <laughs> so that's when I got livid and I got very, very upset. You know, because it's like the, the doctor actually had put in the information for the, you know, for, for treatment to begin to commence, but it wasn't followed for whatever reason. And each time that I approached someone, I would get bounced around to the point where the, the, the physician that I talked to at the doctor's station also 
the, the charge nurse tried to bounce her around as well. I don't know what was going on that day. I don't know, how, maybe because it was a holiday, it was very stressful, but they were just bouncing people all over the place. So I just left a bad taste in my mouth, but we can move on from, from there. <laughs> there was another item that we wanted to discuss, I believe, Fran. Yeah, I think that um, we've been sitting here. If there, if anyone wants to say anything, um, Kim, before we move on, I see Miss Robinson. She was there, but she moved away from her from her camera um, because she's from Elika Samuel's office. Just in case she went, she had any. And I think um, I see Jerry Hopkins. Um, Jerry, would you like to unmute yourself and say hello to the people? Yes, uh, pleasant good evening to everyone. Jerry Hopkins here. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening to you and welcome. Um, Thank you so much. Okay, um, Tahisha, would you like to? Okay, I guess you you showed us the finish. Um, the, the finishing touch of the eggplants. So I think that's it. Um, we have been sitting here with us since six o'clock and I don't want to keep you any longer. I know everyone um, works. I, I'm very thankful for you um, being here with us. I want to thank Tahisha for um, the beautiful cooking um, class that she just gave us. Um, definitely, I as I said, I will try um, this egg, let's try this eggplant dish. Um, we're looking forward for next month, next month, well, not next month, it's June. I think yeah. um, most right. likely, we, although our office will be closed, but we will still continue with um, our programs we have. We have a lot to cover. I will touch base with you, Ms. Blair, on the side. We still have um, on the 21st, of this month, we have a presentation from Kings County Hospital as well. I was looking to, to collaborate with um, One Brooklyn Health and Kings County Hospital to do a community health fair over by, um, in my area. But this month, um, June, July, August, it's such a tough month for me. And I, I wanted the seniors in our area to be able, we have a, a few apartment buildings in our area so that our seniors could come out, they can get um, their blood pressure done. Um, I was looking to, to um, um, get the sugars test, um, have the, do the test and tracing. So I, I was looking to see if we could just have um, the, the streets from Rogers to Washington block off and just have a, a big street um, health fair. I'm not, I, I'm not sure as to how it's gonna work because I, I have, with my job, I have quite a few presentations that I'm doing and um, I'll be um, heading out of town on Jul July 29th and I'll be back in August. So it's cutting it very close to me to be able to put you know, all this together. But in the meantime, um, if any one of you um, come up with anything smaller on a smaller scale, um, apart from the presentations, the health pre presentations that we are having, if anyone should come up with anything else um, that we should look into, anything to do with our seniors. I know it's very difficult to really push anything for our seniors right now, because some of our seniors are not able, they, some of them don't have a laptop, or some of them, they don't know how to get on Zoom. And they may not have anyone at home to really set up to do anything for them virtually. And um, the senior centers are still closed. So there's little that we can do, we can do for our seniors. But whatever else that we can do um, for, the com um, for the community, I, I think also in July, we have in um, with Phoenix will be our, our walk in the park so the flyer they're still working on the flyer so this flyer will send it we'll send out this flyer as well but if any any event that we should think of anything that we should um do for the community anything that we should um on, on a smaller scale don't hesitate to send me an uh, e email don't hesitate to call me or just reach out to me via the the board office and they definitely will forward 
whatever that you send to them and then we will we will work on it you know if you for your organization for any reason if your organization you want to put something for your organization and we and collaborate with us and we could work together i'm happy i'm happy for that and we can work together we can work together on that oh friend something you said reminded me um the senior centers they're going to be opening reopening on june 14th so they're going to be reopening soon and, and, and Fran, Fran, I would like to volunteer. That event you said you're trying to plan uh, uh, on on the street, the street events. Mm -hmm. I'd be I'd be happy when you have a planning com uh, committee meeting for that one. I would be happy to assist with that. Okay, thank you much. I'd be happy for that. Thank you very much. Yeah, right. because right right on your blog there we have those um. How many apartment buildings we have on your block? One. We have over three. About um, four because three, you three have. Three or four, actually, three, uh, three or four. We you have, have one hundred. One hundred. We have uh, right after it, and then there's a, a third one, and then across the street, on the other side, there's a big one too. So you have twenty-five. You have fifty. You have one hundred. And then you have the other, uh, the other three that the insurances are on Lincoln. Yeah, but I still I still count them in, so we can say like five five apartment buildings, and plus on my on my the end of my on on um on um Bedford there are two of them, one co-op and and the other one. So we have quite and we have quite a few seniors in that area there, and then on Rogers Avenue we have a, um another apartment building there, and then the res and then the private homes we have quite a few seniors out there, so. I am still very, you know, eerie when it comes to the COVID. So I want to do anything that I'm doing, but um, very careful as to how we implement it. But but not to discriminate. But it might be a good idea to to have a, a sense of security in the minds of the seniors and their caretakers and caregivers. Uh, do, when when we do that those activities for them, it will be good to assure them that. Those of us who are who are vaccinated uh, yeah. are gonna, gonna play a lead role in terms of the interaction. So they know that we at least we have that insularity, that insul that, that that's 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 there. I mean yeah, and also as also when you as since you bring up vaccinated, I know um on Utica Avenue between church and Linden, you usually have those big um buses, their trucks there that they administer in the Johnson and & Johnson. And then and, and there are some people, they just want the one shot, you know? So we, maybe we could look into that. So anyone who wishes, some people are still leery on the Johnson, about the Johnson & Johnson, but we can maybe still have Melissa to work on that. And that maybe we can have, also have the Johnson & Johnson truck to come because the Moderna and the Pfizer, because of the storage and the, the temperature that it has to be kept under, we will not be able to have them to come out there, but the Johnson and Johnson will be able to come. So we can look into that too as well. So the, people, um, um, people, people in our district can go over to um, Kingsbrook Jewish. They're still um, vaccinating over there with Pfizer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, they, they are. Yeah, but then I'm addressing that persons who have not had it and anyone who may come to the fair and if they wish to get, you know, right, 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 right. then okay. they, they can get that. Um, um, Kim, yeah, we're about to close, and um, I was I just wanted to find out if there is anything happening with the council members' um, office that you want to just say, if you have any announcement or anything happening. No? Um, I just wanted to say that uh, the youth committee- oh, Hold on a minute. Hold on, Mr. Almeno. Go ahead, Kim. Go ahead, Kim. Uh, yeah, there's just a couple of um, events that's happening on the other side, but- um not anything over there um, Mo maurice who normally attends the meeting he would have had more update uh i just signed on for the cooking demo <laughs> and to uh -huh. but um no again we're just trying to encourage people to you know get out there and vote and again try to get as much information as they can about the ranked choice voting also the emergency relief um application is out if anyone has um challenge or any issue and they need help 
to um, fill out the application, you know, they can contact us and we'll try to assist them, make an appointment for them to come in and um, assist them completing the application. Well, we are trying to get the word out there for the rental assistant for um, which are rent arrears, um, utility bills, that application open June 1st and where office is open to assist anyone that needs it. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Mr. Um, Almanar. What I was saying is that the youth committee is working on a field activity and there's a whole idea to do is a, bo I mean, a, a board-wide activity sometime. I think it's, if it's possible, if, the, if everything is nailed down, it would be a good idea that the health committee will participate uh, to bring some health information for the youth. Even now, uh, since now they are vaccinating from uh, 12 to 15, if mm -hmm. possible, some of the hospital connection that you have, they could be part of that because they wanted to do a field day with different activities. So that's the information I wanted to bring forward because okay. I got. I got. I'm, I missed their meeting this week, but I'm gonna get in touch with the chair of the committee to find out to what extent, to uh, at what point they are in, in scheduling that particular activity. The tentative date was um, uh, late August or after Labor Day. Okay. All right. Thank you, um, Mr. Hopkins. Also, and for Ms. Plato, Ms. Blair. In it. Um, also, if we are doing the health fair, pref we will. I'm looking more or less like at the ending ending of August to the to like the week and um, the first week of of, of, of September, nice. and I, I'm really looking forward to doing this. So okay. we will. Um, okay. So okay, if you good. have any any information or anything, any any, so we can start looking into that. So we'll. Um, I will send a meet, uh, um, set a meeting so that we could meet to discuss some more. Lovely. Discuss further, okay? Lovely. Okay, so any, Tanisha, everybody here? I'm sorry, um, Ms. Oh, Go ahead, Denisha. Uh, <laughs> so sorry about that earlier. My phone overheated, you know, that's how technology is sometimes. I'm so sorry about that. But um, I'm, I thank you for, um, I thank everyone for, for tuning in and listening to our cooking show. Um, and um, I do have the final product to show you guys. But before I do, since we're talking about events, I just wanted to share that um, if anyone is going to be in the arts festival from July 2nd to the 4th, One Brooklyn Health will be having some tables there where you can get some free screening. So anybody that you may know, any family members, anybody that'd be interested that's going to the event, Please stop by by our tables. We're going to have a phenomenal time. Our staff will be there taking screenings. We're gonna be having giveaways. We're gonna having, we're gonna just be having a great time. We're gonna be having a great time with our staff and the people there and just adding to the ambiance, but just bringing a health component to it. So if you are gonna be in the area or in the African Arts um, Festival, um, we encourage you to just stop by and um, visit our table. That's downtown Brooklyn, right? Yes. And what um, day is that? Going to be, uh, it's July 2nd to the 4th. Right. Okay. That's Commodore Barry Park, right? Uh, yeah. Um, where is that? Bar Bar where is that? It's like way, way downtown by the bridge. Uh, it's on the Flushing. Flushing. by Navy Street and almost close to the Brooklyn Bridge. It's on Navy right. Street and, uh, and uh, Park, uh, Park Avenue. Okay, so they move it. Okay. All right. Okay. But then they moved the location. Yeah. Yeah, they moved it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, anyone else have um um uh, Warren? Thank you for coming back, Warren. Um, yes. Yeah, so you're, as you're as welcome. Any, <laughs> as anything else, um, this is the community right here for those of you who. Um, would be um, available. I will send out the, the email and we will meet and start this, the, because this is something that I don't like to wait until the last minute to do things. So I think that we should start working on it and, and as to, I don't want um, one Brooklyn to do the very same thing that Kings County will be doing. So each person, each hospital will come up with something different. We'll work together and then we will, we will make this happen for our community. 
and it will be, I mean, although it will be done in this area, but it will be for the community at large. So whoever wants to come, you know, that they will come and have a, have a good time. Maybe we could try to get some sponsors, maybe uh, Mr. Hopkins, we still, we have kids on the blocks and maybe if we, mm -hmm. we, we can get at least some games or something for the kids. Although I'm, um, I, I just hope that if we do that, parents will still have the kids to wear the mask and stuff because I still, <laughs> I'm still very, very, want to be very cautious when it comes to COVID. You know, I'm still not trusting just exposing, having the kids and people exposing themselves. But we still, we still want to have some, some games for the, um, games for the kids. So we have the two blocks. So most likely we can have um, one block where we could have games. The kids could have the fun and the other block where we could have all the trucks. So keep the kids out of harm's way. So they have the right. area where they will have the fun and the other area where we can have, um, we can do the medical, um, do our health thing. So I'm looking for us to, I'm looking for us to, um, I, I also, I wanted us to have a tent um, where we could have podiatrists to come in, for doctors to come in and then they could take a look at um, our seniors to take a look at the fit and see if everything is okay. And, you know, so we will we'll discuss as to what's possible and what's not possible, what we should do and what we should not do. So I will send out an email to everyone so, um, and the date and time and whoever can make it, you know, uh, please be there. But um, Mr. Hopkins, thank you very much. And can you let the, the um, let everybody see your face and let them know of your aspirations, please? Okay, okay, let me do Yes. Let, let, me, let me do that. Let, let me do that. Let me do that. Although you came late when everybody had left already, we had like 17 people on board. Right, okay. So here I am in my in my car and I'm on the run, taking care of business. Um, I, I'm a community organizer. My background is in law and media. I'm at 103 Lefferts. And uh, I'm also currently, uh, folks may have seen my articles and my columns in Caribbean Times, Caribbean Life online, uh, and also here about After Work Networking Wednesdays. I try to bring business leaders, aspiring entrepreneurs and investors together to find ways and means to share best practices and support each other. But beyond that, I'm also an activist and I'm running for city council in the 40th councilmanic district. I'm a registered Democrat uh, running as an independent. Uh, and the reason why I'm doing that is because there are so many Democrats all saying the same thing, but uh, not really doing much about the problem. As a matter of fact, I think some have become a part of the problem. So I try to distinguish myself as a registered Democrat, independently representing the interests of the people based on the concerns we all have and bringing solutions to the problem based on my track record of doing just that. So here I am and my folks can read about more about my platform at Hopkins for City Council. Check it out on Facebook, Hopkins for City Council. Check it out folks. And uh, I, I, I look forward to, to working with you guys. Okay. Thank you I, oh, I should let you. I should let you guys know. I'm also in community board 17, and uh, I do a lot of business in in the in the other end of the the district, towards the south. And so I've been more active in community board 17. I've attended a few meetings uh, from time to time in a couple of different committees in board nine. Um, but uh, I've always been wanting to be more available in, in the committees that I'm registered with in in board nine. So I'm happy to join in here. Okay. Um, you are muted, but I don't know how you're muted, but you got muted. Okay, so yeah, thank you I, again. I, I, got, I was muted for a while there. Okay, so thank you for coming, thank you for stopping by. My um, pleasure. pleasure. So, um, Taisha, go, the floor is yours before we close. Give us the final touch. <laughs> Let's see that, that beautiful dish. I know Kim wants to say it because Kim was oh. taking her notes and everything and Kim. <laughs> so bring that dish okay. to the I camera. Bring the, the dish that next week. I will be trying it next week. Yes. Okay. I will be trying it next I'm week. sure you'll be pleased. I'm sure you'll be pleased. Hi, this is Warren. I second that. I'm going to be trying it also. Awesome. Right. awesome. I want to see pictures. <laughs> And, so, and, I, um, and I do takeout, by the way. So I, I, I want to know, I, 
guys, I want to know what's going to happen with that dish after she show it to us. I mean, where is she located? Can, can, can we partake? <laughs> That's a very good point. That's so funny. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, shield your eyes and feast your eyes on this. So after 20 minutes, about 20, 25 minutes of roasting in the oven, um, this is the final product and this is what it should look like. So here you go. Here you go. Oh, Lord. <laughs> wow. Yum, yum. So, yum, yum. yum. I agree. Um, I, give, I give, give that three yards. Wow, plate. wow. So my question is, do you two take out? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Okay. All fun. right. This is, this is beautiful. Keep me yum, in mind. Yum, yum, yum. Thank you oh, so God, much, you Taisha. Good job. Thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you for having me. Until next time. Thank you so much. Yeah, for we're us. looking forward. We're Good. looking forward to, I, I know the next time, Warren wants to give you competition. So the next time he's going to do something, he's going to be the chef for the next time. He wants to give you competition, you know? And I know definitely we have some cooks online right now. They're just not putting themselves out there, but I know we have some cooks. So the next time they'll be coming on and, you know, say, looking to see what he can do. I know Miss Flato can cook too. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Francesca, I missed the meeting because I had my own meeting that I had to chair. Yeah. Uh, have, did you have your regular meeting yet? Yeah, we finished. We're just finishing right now. Okay, can I make a comment? Go right ahead. That may cost you, but go ahead. Okay, um, <laughs> I just want to say that this has been, I'm the first chair of Community Board 9, and I just want to say that this has been an excellent committee for this whole year. Uh, it's, it has gotten things done, it has set objectives, and it has achieved them, as well as providing public service through One Brooklyn, as well as Kings County. And, you know, I just think it's terrific, and I thank every member and every participant to continue doing it, and we appreciate that. I also want to thank Francesca. Uh, Francesca is just a jewel of our community board and she is just as a, a tremendous amount of work and i think that you have created a wonderful committee that we're going to hear the fruits or bear the fruits for the future so i wanted to thank you i also want to thank Khalib uh for doing being the facilitator of this meeting and just doing an excellent job so on behalf of community board nine i just want to thank everyone and have a good summer Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. I and I too I, I echo that and thank you so thank you very much for the props. And Miss Blair, I thank you. Um from the time I met Miss Blair, she was like, okay, she she wanted to be there with us to join with us at Kings County Hospital. And it, it sometimes things are tight with her, but she would she may not be able to speak, but then she would be there with us. We Miss Plato came on. I've always had her support and I think in it in it came in and then we I kidnapped Enid, so Enid, you know you can't go anywhere anymore. I've got you. <laughs> I know, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and I just want to thank each and every one of you for your support. I mean, it means so, it means so, so, so much. And I know we have so much more work to do for our community. And as I've said before, each one of you brings something special to the table. So it's just like this beautiful um, eggplant casserole or how you want. You see all the different ingredients that she put in there. At the ending is just one beautiful finish. So we all mm. coming together and putting our ideas together, putting our heads together. At the end of the day, we'll just have a wonderful community, a wonderful finish. And, and we will be happy. We'll be meeting. We cannot meet the needs of everybody, but we will try our best to do our best. So that's all we can do. Just do our best. So I thank you so much for your support. Always, I thank you um, for being there, for, just for being there, just being part of the family. Every time you come, I said it, and I keep saying it, anytime you come on this platform, you become my family. So I thank you. Stay safe. Well, can, can I make I'm, an announcement? I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Yeah. Um, 
I'll I'll send the flyer to you. I was I was thinking that I was going to be able to post it in the chat, but there's no chat, so I'll email it to you. But next Thursday, uh, the tenth, Alice Blair is actually going to be a panelist with a uh, on a on a summit called the Caribbean Health Summit, and it's going okay. to be focused on um, addressing mental health support for uh, healthcare providers. It's a Amen. two hour workshop in the evening from 4 to 6 p.m. next Thursday the 10th. So I'll, okay. send, I'll send the flyer so send, to you. Yeah, please send the flyer to, um, to the board and Kalib will graciously put it up on the website and put it out there. Okay, thank you so much. And, and I, just wanna, okay. I just want to okay, say ahead, thank Mr. you. Oh, Miss Blair, Miss Blair, it's good <laughs> to hear your voice. Just want to say thank you so much for letting me be a part of this wonderful community board. Um, I know many times I'm missing in action because I was driving most of the time trying to get home. But it, I listened to everything. Beautiful casserole. I wish I could have a piece of that, Aisha. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so with it's that fine. said, thank you everyone. And looking forward, just keep me in touch. Um, Definitely with That's emails. Fine. All righty, thanks. Thank you Fran, so would, much, thank you so much. I, I would also like to finally say thank you, Fran, for all of, all you do in, in, in the community board and also especially in the, in the Block Association on Lefferts. Tremendous, uh, award-winning Block Association, thanks to your, your devotion. And folks, I want to wish everyone, I want to wish everyone a happy Caribbean American Heritage Month. Started on the oh, first not, of June. And okay. The entire month belongs to those of us who have American. Let's oh, celebrate this month. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you again to our chef. And looking forward to getting some more recipes. And, and I think the next time when we do this, you have to send us the, the, the ingredients. Before. And we will be we will be, at, we will be at our yeah. at our at our um stove. Yeah, we'll, be, we'll do interactive cooking. So everyone yeah, will get yes. the ingredients. You'll be I'll well be aware shopping. ahead of time. Yeah. And we'll do it together. Yes. Yes. I'll do a shopping list for you guys. Definitely. We'll be doing this together. Mm -hmm. And this friend and, and to the group, just wanting you guys to know Kingsbrook is holding, well, One Brooklyn Health is holding uh, another informational session for the community on Monday, June 7th. I will send out an, an email to you guys and Khalid can post it. Uh, for those who want to know about the transformation information about Kingsbrook and the transition of the medical surgical beds, it's happening for June 31st. So that informational session is happening on Monday with the CEO of One Brooklyn Health, Lorraine Brown, should be there to answer any questions or address any concerns. Okay. I thank you so much. I thank you. Thank you, everyone. Again, Melissa, thank you for facilitating. Thank you um, for being there. Thank you for being my um, my back pocket, thank you for being my back. You know, so for, thank you so much, Melissa. And Mr. Almana, you always support. It doesn't matter what, when, how, you were there. So thank you well, so much. I want to wish your sister a speedy recovery. So I was very thank much you. concerned because I grew up near that station. <laughs> so I know the area well. So I was very yeah. concerned. I still have relatives that live a block away. So it's a right. very much concern. So I wish you a speedy recovery. And I'm gonna to talk to you some more because with all the other committee, we've been talking about having a CB9 wide. Yeah. Still day and fair. So that yeah. will be next, next, next Definitely. season. Okay? Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, so CB9. thanks again. And thank you, um, um, Warren, also for always supporting and for, for always being there for us. And, and um, have a good night, Khalib. Thank you, Kim, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Love you guys. Appreciate you, and um, see you. Well, we have a we have a presentation next week. Those of you, the flyer will be out. Those of you who can make it, I'll see you. If not, then I'll see you next month. Good night, everyone. Bon appetit. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Um, Tahisha, can you please send me your um your address so I can come for my my dinner? Yeah. <laughs> no problem. I'll text it to okay. you right now. <laughs> thank, thank you, friend. Good night, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Fran, get enough for both of us. <laughs> <laughs>